Um, we're going to we're going to read the theme passage, John 5, 39 and 40, to just to, I think it's good sometime to bring us back to that, what started this whole thing, uh, and then use that to go look uh, in more of an overview format tonight. So find John 5, 39 to 40. Stand with me if you would as I read these uh, to you, and then we will get into uh, the prophets, minor prophets. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. This is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. And as we've read this, notice again, Jesus acknowledges that they searched the scriptures, the scribes, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they, they did search the scriptures. He acknowledges that. And he even uh, recognizes that they do this because they want to find life in God. And then he chides them. These scriptures talk about me. And you'll see this a, a, a lot in the, in the Minor Prophets. These scriptures talk about me, and yet, searching the scriptures diligently, you reject me, uh, and it's quite an indictment. And it reminds us, before we say that, it reminds us that we need the illuminating work of the Spirit of God to understand what we read. Madeline Murray O'Hare, head of the Atheist League while she was alive, read the entire Bible in one weekend. And all she found in it was a basis to basically blaspheme God. We need the help of the Spirit. So may the Lord help us tonight as we think about these prophets to begin to get a bigger picture of them. Thank you. Please be seated. How many of you have ever studied through the minor prophets? It's a, somebody said this about them. I thought, I thought said, said the, the 17 prophetic books. We've just come through the major prophets. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. The 17 prophetic books of the Old Testament are called the dark continent of Scripture. What are they talking about? When I say dark continent, what do you think? Africa. That was the, it was undiscovered. It was uh, the, the, the ignorant masses on that dark continent. And these 17 books are called the dark continent of Scripture. And while that is true, there's an even greater unfamiliarity uh, with the 12 minor prophets than even with the five major prophets. It was in the late 4th century A.D. that this, co this collection of 12 came to be called uh, the Minor Prophets. And it's not because they were considered less important than Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel, but because they generally are shorter than the five um, major prophets. Particularly when you look at something like Isaiah, which has 66 chapters. Jeremiah, very large work. The messages in the Minor Prophets we're going to see are much more succinct, and it has to do partly with the, with the size of the, of the writing itself. But don't be fooled into thinking that, they, that they're, they're less powerful. When we study these Minor Prophets, and because of their size, we'll be able to do, some, do more reading from the text than we typically do uh, when we're looking at, a, at one of these books, surveying the books. Before Jesus Christ came, these, these 12 books were actually joined together to make one scroll. They were all written on one scroll, and they were simply referred to as the 12, which I think is fascinating when you think about in the New Testament, that's one of the designations given to Jesus' disciples, the 12. And so this was what this collection of books was called. If you look at their combined length, their combined length is one more chapter than the book of Isaiah. 67 chapters make up these 12 minor prophets. Um, when you look at the chrono chronological significance, and we'll, we'll see this in a few minutes, um, the first six, the only thing you can do really is that the first six were written uh, before the last six. But I want to just show you what we call the canonical order. When you see canonical, that's from the canon. From, and the, and this, is, this, by the way, this is the canon of the Bible. The, the canon meaning the book. Um, 
When you see how you find them in the Bible, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, and you're going down. Here's the chronological order when you date them when they were, when they were written. And you'll see that, that, that Obadiah, Joel, Jonah, Amos, Hosea, Micah, they're in, uh, particularly the first five, they're in different orders chronologically than what we have in our Bible. Now when you hit, uh, when you hit Micah and Nahum, uh, Zephaniah, Haggai, Habakkuk, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, they all line up. But until that time, uh, they're, out, they're out of place uh, chronologically. So you just need to recognize that and you'll, we'll, we'll remind you of that when we get into uh, the study of each one of them. The Mount of Prophets from, and, if, and notice back again now, Obadiah would be the oldest one. So when we say the Mount of Prophets from Obadiah to, uh, to Malachi, chronologically, cover about a 400 year span of history and it takes us through the Assyrian, Babylonian, and Persian empires. When you break down northern kingdom and southern kingdom as far as where the prophets labored, three were prophets to the northern kingdom, that is Jonah, Amos, and Hosea. Six were prophets to the southern kingdom, Obadiah, Joel, Micah, Nahum, Zephaniah, and Habakkuk. And three were what are called post-exilic prophets, or prophets after the exile. So you've got three in the north, uh, six in the south, and, and Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi were, were after uh, they'd been taken off into exile. We know very little about most of these minor prophets, even though the books are assigned the names of the prophet. Uh, they, they represent a pretty diverse uh, set of personalities and backgrounds. Uh, so let's, let's think about uh, a snapshot of the 12. And I'm going ahead and put this, put this up for us uh, to, for, as I read this for you to read along so you can maybe, I hope we'll retain a little more tonight and don't expect you to retain all of it, but I thought it'd be a good way to introduce this study. We won't be here really long, a long time because we're going to take a snapshot of these 12. And then we'll come back uh, probably, as I'm looking at the teaching schedule, probably uh, first of the year. We'll come back and delve into these one by one, all right? So first of all, and we're taking these, by the way, we're taking these on, in the order that they appear in our, in our Bibles. But I want you to remember that, uh, that when we talk about... Uh, the chronology, it would be something different. So the first one, Hosea. How many of you are familiar with the story of Hosea? It is an unusual story. It's, uh, I remember studying in one, of my, in one of my doctoral seminars, the debate in class was, did God say to Hosea, go marry a prostitute, or, or did he say to him, go marry Gomer, and as Hosea's writing, he's identifying her as that. And it was a, you read through a lot of commentary and stuff. But that's what he ends up doing. A woman who is unfaithful. And uh, uh, his wife, uh, Gomer, is faithless. But it's a, it's a book designed to illustrate how God's love, how he loves us faithfully even when we are faithless. And he used it to teach Israel about the spiritual adultery they were committing. You would imagine that they would, that they would hear the message of Hosea and think, that's horrible. How could a, how could a wife be that to her husband? And God said, that's what, you, that's what you are to me. That's why you're acting the way you're acting to me. Hosea exposes the sins of Israel and contrasts them to God's holiness. The nation's got to be judged for its sins, but it'll be restored in the future because of the love and faithfulness of God. And so there's the movement that you're going to see when we look at, look at Hosea. Joel, another one of the prophets. This looks back uh, to the, to a, there was a locust plague that decimated the land of Judah. And it uh, shows, uh, anticipates this far more terrifying day of the Lord that is coming. Uh, it's a sort of a foretaste that the land will be invaded. Uh, by a, a, an army 
that will make the locusts look mild in comparison. But it's in that setting that the Lord uses the prophet Joel to call the people to repentance, uh, to, to head off, to stem the, the coming disaster. But they will not change. They refuse to repent. And judgment comes. But as, as we've seen the cycle, you should be familiar with it by now, out of judgment, God will bless His people because he will, he will never completely abandon or forsake His people. He will always have a remnant. That's, a, that's the commitment of God to His holy name. Fulfill His promise. Then you get to the book of Amos. Uh, Amos is warning the people in the northern kingdom that there's doom coming. And it's hard for them to imagine because they're experiencing a real boon uh, in, in their economy and in their social conditions. In Amos, you're going to find eight uh, pronouncements of, of judgments, eight warnings. And uh, he talks about judgment coming to the various nations around them and then comes to Israel. It's very much like if you're familiar with, with Paul's uh, letter to the Romans. He starts out talking about the, uh, the Gentiles and how God's wrath will be poured out upon Gentiles. And, you, and then it says, but also upon Jews. It's a very, very similar uh, theme. Then he lands on Israel, delivers three sermons as he, as he outlines the sins uh, of Israel, and he calls upon them to repent. And you can anticipate that the people reject Amos' warnings, and the coming judgment is portrayed uh, in five visions that he gives. And then there's a word of hope. I'll say at this point, well, let me, let me hold that. I'll hold until we get down to one of the prophets here. But, but this, this you see over and over. We need to understand that it's a mercy of God when He gives warnings of judgment. It's one of the means He uses to arrest His people in their steps, to turn back to Him. But you see over and over in the prophets that the people do not turn back. And I've had some dealings in, in, in the course of 40 years of ministry where, where you can sit with somebody and warn them, here's what is coming. This, and the people, when you do that to people, what do they typically think? What do they say to you? Are you threatening me? Well, was God threatening these people? Because it's not a personal threat. It's not like not I've ever said, well, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. No, here's, here's where you're headed. The path you're on right now means that, that unless you turn, this is destruction that will await you. Is that a threat? No, it's not a threat. It's according to God's word. It's a promise if you don't turn. And so, so you see this uh, warning of judgment, actual judgment, promise of blessing, future hope. Obadiah, perhaps he may be the most obscure of all the twelve, and he's, and he's the smallest uh, of the writings. He's in the southern kingdom. Uh, he speaks to, to Edom. This is interesting. When I thought this was fascinating when I found this. Uh, Edom borders uh, Judah on the southeast. Edom descended from Esau. Remember Esau was lived off the land and refused to act as his brother's keeper, that is uh, Jacob. Judah descended from Jacob. They mocked when Israel, when Jerusalem was invaded and they, Edom ended up themselves in total destruction. And then you have Jonah. Here's what I was going to say a while ago. Do you realize that in the prophetic writings that all, and you can include the major prophets in this, all the prophets would be considered today failures by not getting the people to turn back to God, except one, Jonah. And Jonah didn't want to do what he did. Jonah resisted. It's a, it's a fascinating study in, in, the, in, in God's use of the prophets. Uh, and his, his prophecy is very, very brief. You, I mean, in fact, we hear a lot of, we know a lot of biographical things about Jonah. Except, unless Nineveh repents, it will be destroyed. Right? Isn't that the, isn't that the message? 
Unless Nineveh repents, it'll be destroyed. And the people repent. And Jonah resents it. You find him moping. He said, I knew you were a God like that. I knew that if, if I brought your word to these people, they would repent. And he didn't want them to repent. And so, so it's in the irony of the prophetic witness of Scripture, all these faithful prophets who labored, we looked at Jeremiah recently, just the weeping prophet, never saw a convert his entire ministry. Would be measured level a failure by, by reasonable measurements today. They never saw the success of their message being received. The one who did not want his message received was the one who saw revival, the revival of Nineveh. And so it's a, it's a measure of God's mercy uh, to, the, uh, to those who are not of, of Jewish background. Uh, and so the lesson he learns and, the, and that we will learn in, in the prophetic flow is that God uh, reaches the message of hope is beyond the Jewish nation because he created everyone. He's the creator of all. Then you have Micah. Uh, Micah begins with this warning of, of divine retribution uh, against Israel and Judah uh, because of the, of the radical corruption that you find at every level in their society. The rulers are corrupt. The prophets are corrupt. The priests, judges, on and on and on. Businessmen, landlords. But through all of that, with, and this is again a good lesson. While God uses means, aren't you grateful that the advance of his message and his mission and his mercy is not tied exclusively and depending on individuals? Because in the face of all of this, uh, there's the promise that covenant promises will be fulfilled. And we'll see, when we get into each one of these, we'll see messianic uh, reflections and overtones. And it'll be followed by, by God's forgiveness and restoring the people. And it ends with a strong uh, note of promise. Now when you get into, get into Nahum, you're, you're back where Jonah preached about 125 years after he preached. This is another warning. You've got to remember that every generation, we're always just one generation from a people turning away from the Lord. But the good news is we're always just one generation from people turning to the Lord. Some of the hardest times in, our, in the history of our country came just prior to the first great awakening. But 125 years later, after Nineveh has repented under the preaching of Jonah, Micah is predicting their destruction. They've returned in the Assyrian capital to idolatry and, and, and various forms of brutality. Uh, the Assyrians have overthrown in 722 the northern kingdom of Israel. Uh, and so Nineveh faces destruction, having faced, having experienced revival. And then Habakkuk. Um, this, this prophet labors close to the end of the kingdom of Judah, the southern kingdom. And he's perplexed. He's very much like the psalmist in Psalm 2. Why do the, why do the nations rage? Why do the people plot in vain? Habakkuk asks questions like that. Why God is not dealing with the wickedness of the nation. And God tells him he's going to use the Babylonians as his rod of, of punishment. And so that provokes another question. How can God use a foreign nation uh, that is more wicked than the nation Habakkuk labors in uh, to punish? And so he sees, Habakkuk learns about, about the sovereignty of God. How he's able to take up, because we know, Paul says it, and the New Testament teaches that he, Daniel, um, Nebuchadnezzar acknowledges, he raises up and, and sets down, throws down kings. He is the sovereign God over all creation and over all nations. Habakkuk cries out, Lord, revive your work in the midst of, this, of these days. Zephaniah, uh, puts an emphasis on the, on the coming uh, 
day of the Lord. It would, it would be a, a day of, uh, of judgment. Uh, but it would be followed by great blessing. And so he focuses on the coming judgment. Uh, it was going to be shown to Judah, the southern kingdom. Uh, he broadens it to take in the nations as well around them. And again, Judah refuses in the face of the prophetic warning, refuses to seek the Lord. And he comes under condemnation. But there'll be a remnant. And I, I don't know if you've ever had any teaching done on this or studied yourself on this. It's called the doctrine of the remnant. But no matter how bad things have gotten in, uh, in the history of nations, particularly citizens in the Old Testament, God has always had a people. He's always had a people. This is one of the themes that came up, by the way, when, when you were in the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages, and then you have the, the dawn of light of the Reformation rising. That God, you discover God has always had a people. The, there never was a day when there was just, we were absolutely without, when God was absolutely without a witness on the earth. He's always had a people, faithful people. And so this remnant will be raised up. And then you have a Haggai. Uh, this occurs after, after the Babylonian exile, uh, when the Jews are now returning and beginning to rebuild the temple. Uh, and then they stopped and began to rebuild their own houses instead. Now, you can imagine that has consequences. And you see the picture there. That if God has called you to a task, there are consequences if you turn aside from that task and then focus on, on your own issues. And so the, they don't enjoy his blessing in the land. The prophet Haggai gives an exhortation to, to finish the temple uh, because of the, of the promise of God that when they finished it, it would be filled with his glory. So you see what's going on here, that they turn away from the prospect of glorifying God to meet their own needs, to raise theirs above God's glory. And so there's a chastening that comes attended by a promise, again, of future blessing. And then you have Zechariah. Zechariah is a, is a contemporary of, uh, of, of Haggai. And he also brings an exhortation uh, to complete the construction of the temple, encouraging them. He tries to convince them that the temple, uh, that, that physical presence of the temple is, is key to uh, their spiritual heritage. It'll become a, a symbol, a physical symbol and object lesson to their spiritual heritage. And also demonstrates in the time sequence of God the coming of Messiah. Does this through visions, uh, messages, and these, these burdens, thus saith the Lord. That's what the burden of the Lord is. And in Zechariah you see some very powerful messianic prophecies uh, demonstrated. And he encourages them that, that he's not finished with them. Far from it. And then you come to the last, uh, and this is, this is uh, chronologically and also in our list of, of biblical uh, order, Malachi. The people have gotten uh, cold spiritually. They have gotten complacent and have, have experienced a lapse morally. Uh, their worship, they just go through the motions of worship. It's not, it's not a true devotion to God. And there's a distancing that is, we talked about this morning about drawing near to God. And the true, same thing is true of us. If we're not careful, we will go through the motions. God makes it plain to them that he's not pleased with their worship. And so they begin to compromise. Uh, they compromise on, on the standards of orthodoxy, of their, of their monotheism, of the one, the one true and living God. They compromise in their, in their social functions. And the warning comes from the prophet that the day is coming when the arrogant and every evildoer will be turned into chaff. You know that image? Chaff, uh, you harvest harvest 
the grain and then you shake it out and the grain has a heaviness to it that causes it to fall into the threshing bins but the chaff is like it's so much dust at that point and it's just it's just blown into the wind it it disappears but there's the promise that for you who fear my name the son of righteousness will rise with healings in his wing this is obviously a picture of of the messiah the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in His wings. Now when this happens, chronologically, the people go through a, a period of about 400 years of silence. Think about that. The first 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 years People would be there who are referring back to this, this period of time. A couple of generations come through that, three generations. The next generation comes there. It's getting more and more distant. And there begins to be, and then you go through a period of Jewish history called the, the Maccabean period. You begin to be convinced that God, regardless of what the prophet said, God is finished. This 400 year period of silence where he seems to have no fresh word for them. Not even a word of judgment. In fact, the judgment seems to be that God has just finally withdrawn his presence and withdrawn his countenance from the Jewish people. And you could see in that kind of a time period where it would be harder and harder for those to stand up and speak who are the, who are the sons of the prophets, the grandsons of the prophets, those who who remember the prophets, those who were told about the prophets and have told others, it'd be harder and harder to, to press a convincing message to a people who never received the message of the prophets anyway, to press a convincing message that God still has a plan for them. And when you weave together this chronology, of this desperate time, and you have this, this one uh, unusual man, 400 years later, part of a group called the Essenes. He dresses in kind of a wild way. He eats an unusual diet. And he comes breaking on the scene and he's quoting the prophets. John the Baptist, we know him as. But he is the first voice speaking for God under the authority and authorization of God to break forth in 400 years after these period of the minor prophets. And so what we're going to be moving into in the next, the next several weeks, next will take us approximately three months if we, if we break it out that way, to go through these, is to see God's repeated merciful warnings, His merciful judgments to turn His people back to Himself. Then the promises and the blessings and the hope restored. And then them taking his blessings and uh, basically presuming that they will always be a blessed people. And you know the connection biblically is if we are a people who bless the Lord, then we will know the blessings of the Lord. And the day we begin to forget the blessings of the Lord is the day that we will begin to lose the, the favor of his countenance, or the kindness of his blessings and his mercies. And yet through it all, he's working out his purpose to bring Messiah. And so, so it's kind of a fascinating thing when, you, when you're able to view uh, this panoramic look uh, at Jewish history, which becomes our history because the end result of it is uh, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight the paths for our God. And that'll be John the Baptist, okay? So that's, that's where we're headed in these next uh, several weeks. In, if any questions or comments or observations about, about that picture, anything you want to pursue a little further?